so thank you, Chris, for the introduction. Um, uh, so far, this has been a really productive um, symposium. Uh, I've, I've learned a huge amount. Um, Ruth's aim in choosing nature and the environment um, was to be able to look at all these different topics from as many angles as possible over the two and a half days of our symposium. So in terms of people's ideas and attitudes about their world, in terms of how these appeared in literature and visual representation, how they were deployed to reflect values and beliefs, how people responded to changes in their environment, as well as in respect of the more obviously material realities of the world people inhabited, whether urban or rural, metropolitan or provincial. Um, so today in particular, uh, we're going to be looking at how the medieval landscape was exploited as well as how it changed over time. And perhaps more specifically in this session, how we can begin to find out uh, about how that was, how that worked. Um, Adam's introduction at the beginning of the symposium provided a nice framework within which to think about the topic um, we're going to talk about in this paper, namely the way the production of cereals such as wheat, barley, millet, and so forth developed and was managed across the Byzantine um, period. Um, this is one of the projects some of us are engaged on as part of our climate change and history research initiative based at Princeton, although most of us aren't actually in Princeton most of the time, certainly not under the current circumstances. One of the most important facets of the Byzantine economy was, of course, its grain supply. And it's also an ideal topic in which to bring together in a properly integrated way the different skills and knowledge needed to study it properly. Although we talk about history, archaeology and palynology in our title to reflect the main things we're going to talk about, um, I should make it clear at the outset that there are specialists from many other paleoscience fields involved. Neil and I had intended to talk in particular about the grain supply of Constantinople, but in the end we haven't made enough progress yet on that. So what we're going to be talking about today is, while still very much a work in progress, um, uh, uh, only in the opening stages of grappling with the complexity of the material, but I hope we can give you a, a reasonable idea of, um, of what we're doing. There are obviously several good reasons for wanting to know about uh, or wanting to know more about agricultural production, especially about what and how much might have been grown and when. It helps us to say quite a lot uh, about what the carrying capacity of a particular district might have been, how many people, how many animals, etc. it could have supported, and also then about demographic trends, the fate of rural and provincial settlement over the longer term, and so forth. And all this is helpful when it comes to understanding many aspects of Byzantine history, from politics through taxation to the way in which people dealt with the various challenges that confronted them, both on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as less often in terms of things like food shortage and drought, the effects of um, climate change and so forth. So what we'll talk about today are two different but complementary aspects of this. Neil's going to talk about elements of the broader context and the history of agrarian production and landscape in the Byzantine period, focusing particularly on the, on the pollen data. Um, and this will be within the framework of the changing climate conditions to which the Eastern Roman world was subject across several centuries, on which, as Adam mentioned, our group or groups have already done quite a lot of work. But I'll start by saying a little bit about how we can set about reconstructing land use and generating uh, some framework for understanding uh, what was produced and where. Let me just make sure my slide is changing. All right, let's go back one. Okay. Um, now, just a moment while I figure out my slides. <clears throat> Um, I just wanted to remind you briefly of some of the points that Adam made as well in his opening lecture. This is a useful table he developed that we've used showing the different sorts of evidence uh, accompanied by the sorts of things they can tell us about and their value for looking at the economic history of the empire, um, the nature uh, of the information they impart, um, uh, and the degree to which they can offer some chronological precision or not. And I show it now simply to underline both the range of types of evidence we can draw upon, but also some of the difficulties attending an integrative approach since making these different sorts of evidence work together is not straightforward. So 
So given these very different types of data, one of the first issues any team project needs to address is the problem of scale and commensurability and how we can link these fields together in a way that helps us build a holistic picture of the agricultural economy of a region or a district. So I'm going to start by saying a little bit about some work we've done in this connection using the results of our survey at AFCAT or Medieval Efkaita in North Central Anatolia. Something's wrong with my slide movement. I don't know why it's not progressing properly. So FKIT is probably best known for it being the center of the devotion um, to St. Theodore the Recruit and later his big brother, the St. Theodore the General. You can see him in the, uh, in the 10th century ivory on the slide. Um, and Efkaita seems to have become more important in the period from the 7th to the 9th or early 10th century because it wasn't far from the new frontier zone um, and seems to have had a military function, although we don't really know exactly what it was, in addition to its status as a metropolitan bishopric and the cult of St. Theodore and the associated annual fair. Uh, it has new significance from the 7th century on for another reason. It lies firstly within a region which, as Adam showed us on Saturday, benefited from increased precipitation from the 6th into the middle of the 8th century, um, which, as long as it's not too great, is good for grain production. And then secondly, we also have evidence from the written sources that this region, as well as Paphlagonia to the west, took on a new importance as possible grain sources for Constantinople at some point before the early 9th century. It lies also within one of the catchment zones where from the 7th century, as the pollen evidence can show us, there was an increased emphasis um, in the uh, production of cereals and livestock raising. Efkaita itself probably lies too far inland for moving grain to the coast and then shipping it elsewhere. Um, but it is, on the other hand, close to several major military bases near the new frontier and armies need grain and livestock. There have been a number of important advances in understanding and the interpretation of many of the written sources for the history of agricultural production in general and grain production and grain supply in particular since John Teal was writing in the 60s and early 70s. And there's now much better access to many of the archival materials such as the Athenite charters and related documents, along with new editions and technical commentaries of many texts. We now also have a vast amount of detailed archaeological material to which Teal had no access simply because it didn't yet exist when he was writing or because it was neither synthesized nor made accessible in a way that could usefully contribute to the discussion. But Teal's work remains an absolutely fundamental starting point for our project, uh, not just because of his extensive presentation of the available written sources, but also because of his analysis of the issues in respect to grain supply that the eastern part of the Roman Empire faced in the course of its history. For the first time, of course, we now also have access to the fruits of paleoscientific work, which means we can begin to ask the sorts of questions Teal couldn't, or at least for which he could not hope to, have answers. So Teal tried to sketch in a complete history of the grain supply for the whole of the empire and across its history from late antiquity onwards. Um, but one of the things, again, pointed out by Adam at the beginning, one of the things that becomes apparent as soon as you begin to work on the climate and, and environment of the Byzantine world is the importance of regional and sub or even micro regional differences. This is especially the case for Anatolia, which because of its particular geography and the fact that it lies at a point across which three different climate systems intersect has a high level of such variation. This affects how we understand our evidence for agrarian activity and the ways in which we approach questions about choices made by farmers and about agricultural output and agricultural resilience to occasional environmental stresses, stresses such as drought and so forth. Um, so homing in on particular localities where we have the evidence in order to take account of these spe special or specific characteristics is, is, a, is a priority. And on the map, I'm showing four regions we've been using to zoom into such regional and micro-regional levels. Um, uh, we chose these because for each of them, we have a, a reasonable amount of historical, archaeological and paleo-environmental data 
for the late Roman and Byzantine periods and beyond. And although the written and archaeological data are patchy, the three types of evidence do overlap with one another, enabling us to use them in complementary fashion and also to suggest new questions that this combination of data can suggest. In the case of uh, Efkaita or modern Avkat, C in region three on the map, we have quite a lot of uh, documentary evidence. We have a limited amount of archaeology from our field survey, and we have some broad brush regional and paleo environmental materials. Still can't work out why my slides aren't progressing. There we go. Combining the archaeological and paleo-environmental evidence, we can also make more effective use of Ottoman data for this particular settlement, as well as for others, of course. Um, uh, but for this particular settlement, its neighbours, which gives us some quantitative starting points for the region, as well as a rough guide to the ratio between population and production. This, in turn, can help us with the potential ranges for output and population of certain crops. All of this provides uh, a starting point, a working framework. And this approach, of course, isn't new. Indeed, it's been the main way to do this sort of work in the past until the advent of uh, and deployment of paleoscientific approaches. As well as the Ottoman evidence, we also have data for grain production for Anatolia from the period between the two world wars um, after the foundation of the Turkish Republic, um, when farming methods had not yet been modernized and which were in many respects comparable with the situation in medieval times. And I, I'm just showing uh, a page from TT387, uh, um, a detailed defta of uh, 1530 for Avkat here called Efhud, which records that the village at that point consisted of some 29 households, so quite small, none of whom were Christians, and it paid a total of just over 4,000 silver actuaries per annum in tax. Most of the modeling and analysis was carried out by our colleague and team member, Peter Bikoulis, who started by using modern or near contemporary Turkish census data on cereal output for the uh, Efkaita region, together with contemporary information on land use change over recent decades, so that he could set a baseline from which to work. He then incorporated climate data in the form of precipitation and temperature averages to identify annual trends across the 20th century. And the information that he thus uh, gathered could then be combined with a model of arable land derived from multispectral analysis of Landsat imagery uh, that I've illustrated in the, the slide here. And satellite remote sensing scenes were used to exemplify decadal land change cover, giving us a series of visual time slices. Um, Let's hope this works. So taken from the satellite data um, uh, and other GIS uh, data, we could build a, a, a digital elevation model through which the landscape could be visualized and experimented on using different data sets. So on the, on the left, the larger image is from the, the satellite photography and then the DEM, which in fact, what I'm showing you here is just the Acropolis of the area above the village with some of our survey results superimposed upon it. But it gives you an idea of, uh, of what we were able to do. Uh, these scenes were then subjected to land use change detection methods used by modern agrarian science um, to determine the location of major recent changes in the landscape as observed through shifts in vegetation productivity. Uh, Peter did this using something called the NDVI, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, which is a well-established and proven method um, used by agrarian research science today as a proxy for vegetation abundance and health at various scales of analysis. And my slides are still playing around. There we go. A range of data was then collated for land use and the ratio between cereals uh, ready or not uh, for harvest, waste and barren land, and uncultivated land 
for a number of village communities of different size within our survey region and according to two sets of potential hinterlands for each determined by proximity to neighbouring settlements and by the time taken to reach fields from the notional home settlement. Together with the evidence of soil types, this helps identify zones in both the present and the past that are or were most amenable to cereal cultivation and stock herding within the study area for each settlement. Of course, we have to map as far as possible the location of other historical settlement foci around our main site, something that still needs to be completed. But all of this helps to establish criteria about land use and carrying capacity and productive potential so that we can begin to work our way back and compare with our business evidence um, what we've got, taking also into account information we might have for changes in local climate. Unlike for some parts of Cappadocia, however, uh, we don't yet have precise enough pollen data to permit a more accurate annual or even decadal dating for any observable changes. And then using site territorial analysis models, Efkaita as well as the nearby villages can be attributed with defined agricultural hinterlands. The models allow us to run some calculations using different parameters each time on the range of potential outputs and carrying capacity uh, of the settlements. And by comparing the modern situation with that in the Ottoman period and with what we know about changes in landscape since the Byzantine period, and by using the extant Byzantine evidence for cereal production, we can generate a set of hypothetical annual cereal production values for the villages in our region, as well as some plausible demographic figures. The immediate agrarian territory around Efkaita, based on a one hour's walk perimeter, amounted to some 770 hectares, or 7.7 .7 square kilometres. And this could produce annually uh, about 40,000 kilograms of wheat, so 400 metric tonnes, as you can see. Uh, based on a standard return on seed sown and a standard quality of land, as described in Byzantine sources. But one can obviously vary these, vary these parameters to model different sets of historical and climatic circumstances. There's also an extended agrarian zone beyond this, which needs to be included in the overall picture, and which in the Byzantine period almost certainly uh, extended beyond today's village territorial limits. Uh, although it does also seem that the basic distribution of settlement in the Mechidezu Valley uh, around Efkaita is not too different from that prevailing in Ottoman and more recent times. And using all this material, one can go on to model the relevant variables that would reflect, among other things, the percentage of the harvest consumed through taxation, for example, the limits on the size of any transient population, such as during the annual fair, uh, and so on. But using all these um, uh, stats, we can uh, produce some standard figures suggesting that the immediate agrarian hinterland of Avcad could probably comfortably support between 500 um, and 600 people. There are, of course, lots of cautionary points to be made. First and foremost, these are hypothetical averages based on evidence from Byzantine and Roman sources, Ottoman comparisons, and our modern reconstructions about the land. Secondly, there are limitations on the, uh, on the um, uh, area around each settlement uh, accessible for agriculture, and then the areas beyond that through which uh, access can be had through the territory of other settlements. And thirdly, just as Hugh reminded us, capacity to produce a given amount doesn't mean that farmers or landlords or, or whoever actually chose to produce that amount, since all sorts of social and economic factors intervened in that decision as well. Anyway, I'll stop here. As I said, this is still work in progress. We need more information about the medieval settlement pattern around our site. We don't yet have for the immediate locality closely dated pollen evidence, which will help us be much more specific about local conditions. But I hope I've given you some idea of what we're trying to do. And as you'll see in Neil's section, which I'll hand over, uh, to which I'll uh, hand over now, the pollen evidence will be a crucial element in building the picture at both regional and local levels. So thank you very much and over to Neil.
Okay, can you see that? Just, got, just under 10 minutes, Neil. Yeah, no, I know, we're a bit short of time. So, um, uh, John already uh, showed this map. I think the, um, the point I would make is that pollen um, in its raw form is relatively indigestible for historians or archaeologists. And what we need to do, what we've tried to do is convert it into a form which is more usable. Um, and one way of doing that has been to produce uh, regional syntheses for areas for which we also have good historical, documentary or archaeological evidence. And you can see those there and ringed are a series of pollen diagrams. And what we've done is create the average condition for every century period for each of those four regions. And I'm just going to run through some of these results. Adam already showed you this, but I'd just like to give a little bit more detail. Uh, the, the first of them deals uh, that I'll show deals with serial uh, type pollen. Um, now there are complications about converting that to real cereals, but I'll, I'll, I'll bypass those for the moment. And what we've done is synthesize that for the four regions, Northern Anatolia, South Central Anatolia, essentially Cappadocia, Northwestern Anatolia, Bithynia, and Southwest Anatolia, uh, which is essentially Pisidia, covering the period from the fourth to the 13th century from left to right. And what you can see in the, in the blue band on the, on the left-hand side is that all regions show relatively high levels of grain, cereal grain production up until the seventh century. There's then a gap of typically two to three centuries when cereal uh, pollen declines quite dramatically before recovering in all four regions during the 10th and 11th centuries to values that were, uh, occurred before. So there was clearly a significant broad, very widespread period of uh, decline in cereal production. Um, and if we combine those four regions together, then it makes it quite clear that between the, the late seventh and perhaps the, the end of the eighth, ninth century, uh, uh, there must have been a major reduction in grain supply from these regions of inner Anatolia, uh, inner Anatolia to the rest of the Byzantine Empire and specifically to Constantinople. If we look at other crops now, um, uh, Hugh and Warren have talked already about the pollen, about the pollen and other evidence for olive cultivation. What's striking is that whereas all four regions show relatively high levels of olive pollen initially in the early Byzantine period, and they also show a decline at the same time as the grain pollen declined, only one of the four areas saw recovery in um, the, in the 10th and 11th century, that was in, in Bithynia. The other three regions saw no recovery, so essentially uh, the tree crops, which had been an integral part of the economy in late classical times, uh, did not return in early medieval times. Just one thing just to add to that, if I may, and that links to the question of the climate controls on olive cultivation. And what's striking about those data is that, um, as uh, was pointed out uh, yesterday, uh, Tim uh, Pitt was talking about the late antique little ice age starting in the sixth century, um, that there is no decline in olive production immediately following on from that. Um, so that clearly uh, olive cultivation was able to survive through that, but having, once it was removed subsequently, almost certainly linked to the period of the Arab Wars, uh, it was no longer worth the investment of, of uh, returning the economy to one that included significant olive cultivation. Uh, finally, I've put something up on uh, grazing weeds as a proxy for livestock herding. The pattern there is, is much more like that for cereals. Uh, high values initially a decline during the period of the extended uh, conflict with the, with the um, uh, Abbasid and uh, Umayyad uh, caliphates, and then a recovery uh, in uh, medieval times. Um, I, I'll pass through that uh, differences in, in, in cereal production. Um, John already made uh, uh, some dis discussion of that. But what I would like to do is, is just extend um, the analysis to uh, one or two other areas and, and make the point that we do have pollen from some, but not all areas. We don't, for example, have pollen data from uh, Egypt. Um, so we really can't use it to help that. But we do from, for example, the Levant. And if we carry out the same kind of analysis done for 
those four Anatolian regions for uh, the Jordan Valley. And I've, I've used three sites uh, here, uh, one of which by the Dead Sea was, was mentioned in, in, in one of the talks yesterday uh, by, by Henry Maguire. Uh, at the top here, we've got cereals, then tree crops, almost entirely olive and then grazing weeds, again for the same time period. What we see is that, is that olive cultivation under, underwent a major long-term decline at the time of the, uh, the, the loss of, of this by the Byzantines, whereas uh, cereals and grazing weeds and therefore livestock continued um, for, on a fairly stable basis. So clearly the fact that there, there was no extended period of warfare here allowed much greater continuity in the rural economy but not for olives which were clearly grown as a commercial cash crop and we can see that very carefully, very clearly when we look at the, uh, num the proportion of olive pollen for the, the period for the, the, the fifth and uh, the, the, uh, the fifth and the sixth century we see very high values indeed in the southern Levant. Clearly this was an area of major commercial olive uh, tree growing and production and export by the time we come to the following 200 year period the 8th and the 9th century that had almost entirely disappeared down to uh, local olive production. Uh, where was the grain therefore coming from um, and pollen can't give us definitive answers but here are some clues. Uh, these are diagrams from uh, for grain, uh, cereal grain from three other areas, uh, Sicily, uh, Cyprus, and a new data set from near Ephesus. And what's striking is that these show a different pattern to the one in, in Anatolia. In Sicily and Cyprus, there's quite a big peak in cereal uh, pollen, uh, dated currently to the eighth century. Those dates might change with revisions. And in Ephesus, there was an, an extended period. So I think we can see areas which provided potentially alternative grain sources to the empire. Um, more work, other areas need to be covered, but here are some indi indications. So finally, in conclusion, I think we can say uh, that during the long crisis of the 7th to the 9th century, uh, the empire and specifically Constantinople lost its olive oil supplies from the Levant and grain from Egypt. Uh, you don't in fact need the pollen to tell you that, um, uh, but um, they, the pollen does tell us that there must also have been a big decline in grain supplies coming from inner Anatolia and the alternative areas, uh, the Aegean, Sicily and potentially the Southern Black Sea for which we don't really have good pollen evidence from the lowland zone currently. Future work, uh, clearly GIS which John uh, mentioned, uh, which include a, a range of different factors, including transport costs, which we haven't discussed here, and then using the texts and the pollen as a way of calibrating and testing those model results. So with that, I will call to a halt one minute late. Mm.